welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a show that endeavors to bring you highlights of what's going on on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada, the wide, wonderful world. I'm Robin Adair. Great to have you join us on this show. We really appreciate people coming on board and sticking with us and uh, we, we explore the issues together and uh, we, we love the feedback we get as well. And with me across in his, uh, in his usual Saanich sidecar is the Croatian sensation himself, John Jurisic. And uh, John, so much going on. Robin, so much going on, so much going on that uh, you and I have discussed the opportunity uh, to set up a news and information Facebook group. We can't cover it all, Robin. There's so much new. It's like a it's like a fire hose. Okay, so you know we're going to set up the Rumble Room News and Information Facebook group, and we're going to let people put their news down because there's so much of it. Great idea, Robin. We're going to post opinion, and hopefully that opinion reflects some of the things you see on this Rumble Room, where we endeavor to be in that middle area that represents the majority view. We're not extreme right, we're not extreme left. We're trying very hard to be measured in our comments. We, we try to support things that we think are logical and are proactively positive for the province of British Columbia and for Canada and for the world for that matter. But we're really trying to come up the middle. If you share that kind of a value system, you'll have a happy home. A happy home if you join our group site. Absolutely. Well said. We are in the middle and we try to represent people's interests. Listen, I'm really pumped that Royal Roads and military and diplomacy expert, Dr. Chris Kilford, will be with us in just a couple of minutes talking about tons of news. Tons of news and tragic news is coming out of the Balkans and Ukraine. This remains a tough and terrible situation. We can't take our eyes off of it. It's on TV. It's everywhere, isn't it? So we'll get a read from him on what's happening in Ukraine very shortly. But right out of the gate, Robin, Operation Bear Hug. Operation Bear Hug. Make me feel good, Robin. We got the full meal deal, John. They came down here, they saw, they tried to conquer. Right from across Western Canada, big trucks came across on the ferries. They uh, started up island, they came down the island, they thundered into Victoria. And, uh, you know, again, these folks are very upset at government about a lot of things that they think are wrongheaded and are against personal freedom. COVID mandates, masks, vaccinations. Uh, they want all of that stuff tossed they want jobs reinstated. And, you know, I, I went downtown and I, I watched the procession and uh, a big hats off to the Victoria police, by the way, did an excellent job of managing a situation that could have got out of hand. They managed traffic. Uh, they kept people out of the residential areas like James Bay. Lots of honking, but it didn't keep people up <laughs> who are trying to sleep during the day, I guess, or just enjoy their regular lifestyles in our in our regular small town communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kept things orderly, but the supporters were still heard. And if you were downtown, this is what you might have seen. grounds in Victoria. We were thinking about taking uh, the group and convoying from Victoria to Campbell River next weekend and bring the rally to Campbell River for next weekend. So we're just working on some details and stuff of where we can go. We have a couple spots that we're thinking about. Just need to make some arrangements. Uh, so just putting it out there, uh, you know, what some people would think about that and uh, not even go down to the ledge grounds. It's a big red zone area right now. And uh, unless you have a hotel or live down there, you're not getting down there. So we're thinking about going the opposite direction this time. Instead of going from Campbell River to Victoria, let's go from Victoria to Campbell River. <laughs> Hey, 
And you know, John, the mask mandates have ended. We all are, are relieved and pleased about that. No one wanted to see this continue. In many ways, we share the same frustration as the truckers and their supporters, maybe not the extreme viewpoints of some of them, but we're all tired of the pandemic. I mean, we don't want it to come back. And on the 8th of, of April, uh, the passports won't be necessary to get into restaurants and bars and clubs and go to see theater or go to see sports events. And we're all looking forward to that as well. And, uh, you know, Johnny, uh, a lot of people, though, are still wearing their masks. I see them in grocery stores. I even saw somebody driving his car the other day still wearing his mask. So people are trying their best to uh, get used to the new system. And it's going to take some time. Robin, I still wear my mask. My wife doesn't. I wear my mask. I can't get out of that. It's been two years. This stuff doesn't change overnight. I don't want to wear a mask. I don't want to worry about where the mask is. I, therefore, am happy to see the health rules relax. And I think over time, it just is going to be a habit that's going to change. But people are still nervous. I'm still nervous. And I guess this kind of explains why some people have very mixed feelings about these cruise ships coming back in April. That was that was a big announcement. That's a huge impact on our local economy. We need the tourism dollars. Come on, we need them um, to 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 help finance our, our local uh, small businesses. And yes, all these cruise passengers, you know, they're tested when boarding their vessel, and they must be double vaccinated. They, they they're like fully. Uh, full, fully pr protected, apparently, so are we. However, we have had responses from our viewers who are less than thrilled about these American tourists hitting our shores. So here's a reaction. I'm going to share with you some of these opinions that people feel freely to, to post on our site. Give it two or three weeks for BA2 to spread. It's 80% more infectious than Omicron and actually may result in less mild disease. This pandemic is far from over. And you know, that is a, that is a viewpoint held by people and people are nervous. We've had two years of being extremely careful. There's a nervousness. It doesn't mean that you and I, John, are opposed to the cruise ships coming back. We know that the economy needs it, and we really believe that it's being done as safely as possible. We're crossing our fingers. This is all going to work out. Um, and, you know, we decided to go out and talk to some people. It was a rainy afternoon. I reached out to Jeff Bray from the uh, Downtown Victoria Business Association to get his feelings about the cruise ships, and this is what he had to say. So what are you guys doing then? What's the what's the prep? The, well, it's just oh, we're just sitting there, cleaning the docks up for the yeah the crew and are they a mess? Oh, well, there's for the last two years there's been uh, people been stolen here from different shipping companies and they just seem to leave all their crap behind. So the best of news, it looks like the cruise ship industry is going to start off with a bang, not a whimper. The federal government has decided to remove the requirement for testing before you come off ship. As long as you prove you're double vaccinated, you can tour Victoria, which is good news for the tourism industry and all those businesses in Greater Victoria, depending on those tourist dollars. There is going to be, uh, the Chamber is taking the lead of uh, sort of a, an acknowledgement of that first ship on April 6th. Uh, and so that will be something that will be very exciting. And really it is uh, not only just the first cruise ship in Victoria, it's the first cruise ship in Canada in two years. So it really is a big deal. And I know that our retailers and our craft breweries are very excited to welcome our visitors from across the border and internationally again. Was this kind of a make or break year for a lot of businesses? You know, uh, the federal government has done a great job of keeping a lot of these businesses going through their subsidies. But the fact is, a lot of those businesses cater entirely to international tourists. So having them coming back in these strong numbers is great news. But it's also good news after this summer that now that people can start planning for conferences and international conferences, knowing with some certainty that their members can come across the border. And that's really important for our tourist sector come the fall and even the winter. Great little clip from Jeff Bray. I really welcome the return of cruise ships. It's essential. It's, it's the heartbeat of Victoria 
for a good six months, Robin. It's the heartbeat for a lot of businesses too. Um, and I am hopefully, uh, hopefully one day my wife and I can go on a little trip somewhere, maybe on a cruise, maybe with my family. Clearly, we are all tired of this pandemic. We are. It's gone on for too long. But, you know, comparatively speaking, you know, what's going on in Ukraine, what I see hourly on the TV, our COVID woes are really pale in comparison, don't they? Yes. You're talking about the Ukraine, of course. Uh, we're all feeling bedraggled by the pandemic. And of course, there's just the normal wear and tear of life. But then you see what's going on in the Ukraine, the terrible, terrible destruction, people losing their lives, millions of people having to leave as refugees. And our own Ukrainian community associations across the province are reaching out, they're doing their best to send aid and to also bring ultimately Ukrainian refugees to the West Coast. There's so much work going on, and it's such a terrible situation. We're so glad that we have the opportunity to speak to somebody who's knowledgeable about diplomacy, about military strategy. And uh, this is Dr. Chris Kilford from Royal Road University for uh, over 30 years, I think 36 years, was uh, in the uh, armed forces and uh, knows his way around these issues. Let's find out what he has to say about what's going on in the Ukraine right now. Let's zoom him in. And now joining us in the Rumble Room again from Royal Roads is Dr. Chris Kilford. And uh, great to have you back on the program. I'm very glad to be, be here, Robin and, and John. Thank you for having me back. It's a, a sad circumstance to have you back because it's a, a terrible calamity, but it's great to get a credible voice to weigh in on this issue. And uh, I'd like to ask you about the war in Ukraine from your perspective, what has surprised you about this conflict? What was expected and what's unexpected? Yeah, the list is so long in terms of surprises. You know, first of all, I recall talking with you and saying I'd be surprised if Russia actually did attack Ukraine because uh, the costs would be so high on, on either side. Uh, it was the, the least uh, uh, best option, I think, from Putin's perspective, but he decided to go down that route. And I also remember telling uh, or saying that, you know, what if the Ukrainians were to win? I'm not sure that they can actually win. And I actually don't like the term win because, of course, people are dying. But the fact is the Ukrainians, there's the other surprise, have done so incredibly well in, in, uh, in holding off the Russians. But, you know, perhaps it wasn't a great surprise because Canada and other countries have been training the Ukrainian military since 2015. Uh, we knew that they were good at what they do. And, and um uh, and they've proved it. And of course, then there's another surprise that, of course, yes, Putin went in to Ukraine. Uh, we all thought the um, uh, Russian military had gone through a, a significant period of modernization after their invasion of Georgia in 2008, which didn't go so well. Um, but clearly, uh, whatever they were doing uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't had any effect. And perhaps it's due to uh, high levels of corruption within the armed forces and money being siphoned off. And so that big defense budget actually isn't getting down to the troops. Um, they've uh, been using conscripts, which they said they wouldn't do. And so, so here's a big surprise, the big reveal. The, uh, the vaunted Russian armed forces is actually not that, uh, that good at all. Um, the other surprises that have come out of this is, of course, uh, how, how the West in particular, and not just the West as we know it, but other countries like South Korea and Japan and so forth, have all come together to say this isn't the right thing to do in 2022, uh, or at any time for that matter, but certainly not now. And, and so we've seen, the, seen, seen many countries coming together to put you know, incredible sanctions on Russia. Uh, we've seen the European Union come together, and more importantly, NATO come together. Um, we've talked about this before. Um, uh, certainly, uh, President Obama and President Trump couldn't get NATO members to pay 2% of their GDP uh, for defense. But if one person has been able to do that, it's Vladimir Putin. I bet you he didn't see that coming, did he? <laughs> oh, man. Chris, one of the unexpected surprises is, of course, the friendship that we've both developed with you. I think we're at about half a dozen podcasts and unfortunately, likely many more. And Hopefully, we'll see you at some of your uh, CIC-based events. We're very lucky to have someone so knowledgeable as you joining us. Thank you very much. You served for 36 years in the armed forces. I did. Including <laughs> senior positions as military attache. From that vantage point, how do you think Canada 
has responded to this crisis with NATO still threatened. Can we possibly ever see more Canadian troops and ships headed to Europe? Yeah, well, we have been. I mean, we've had a significant presence in Latvia for quite some time, and we've also been helping in Romania with uh, air patrols with our CFA teams. Uh, we have frigates uh, in the Black Sea from time to time, in the Mediterranean, in the Baltic. I mean, we've had a fairly uh, significant presence there uh, okay. anyway, mm -hmm. and we've increased that number of uh, the number of troops in, in Latvia and so forth. And I, I don't think that uh, we will be drawing those troops down any yeah. any time soon. I hear in the media, you know, there's this constant reference among politicians that that in fact we we we're not a strong military nation, therefore we need to help in these other ways. And it comes across as though we're not doing anything, you know, and yet we are when I mean I'm quite surprised by what you've just said. Yeah. So, I mean, NATO is a collective. Uh, there are 30 countries within NATO. We're the sixth highest defense spender. And surprise, uh, globally, we are the 12th highest defense spender in the world, which, of course, we never think of uh, no. as being. And we always think that we don't have anything in the shop window. And you know what? Um, yes, we are the 12th highest defense spender, but we are missing a lot of key capabilities. And I think, um, again, um, through Putin's actions, he's going to have to, uh, he's forced the government to take a hard look at, at where we are uh, from a defense perspective. We'll probably see more investments in the Arctic. It's about time we selected a new fighter jet. Um, we need other capabilities as well. So um, it, it, it's taken this, of course, to make us uh, wake up. And then from the government's perspective, uh, we've seen a lot of military assistance being provided to Ukraine. I never imagined that we would be providing, uh, uh, you know, much of our anti-tank uh, weapons stockpiles to them, to our grenades and other, other, uh, other assistance like that. I think if, um, if I was in charge, and obviously I'm not, but if I was, I would be looking to send uh, mortars, ammunition, uh, even our smaller 105 millimeter ar artillery pieces um, uh, to assist the Ukrainians. It, it, it means stripping us bare, but I think that's fine uh, in this particular mm. case. Mm. So from what you're saying, it sounds like you're suggesting the Ukrainians could actually win this, whatever winning this sort of thing really looks like. A at the very least, we're seeing a lot of messaging from Moscow that there's Suggestions that negotiations are going well, that, uh, you know, the, the, the Russians are trying to sound very reasonable in this while they continue to bomb all the big cities. And there's a lot of people getting killed. But reading between the lines on that, do you think the Russians are getting nervous that perhaps they're not going to come out on top in this? Yeah, I think they would be concerned. Uh, I would say that they actually haven't come out on top now. And it's awful to speak of winners and losers, because obviously, no one wins right out of this at the end of the day. Uh, there is a victor, somebody will walk away, maybe both sides will walk away and say that they won. Um, Putin will need to say that he won, even though everybody knows that he's lost in so many ways, economically, politically, militarily, um, everybody will spin it their own way. But if anything, I mean, it's the Ukrainian people themselves who um, have uh, also woken up. You know, uh, this this will will make um, you know it's sad to say that so many people are going to die, but this will make Ukraine such a stronger country in the future. Do you um, think there's going to be a peace out of this? Do you, do you, are you forecasting that yeah. they're going to come to some sort of a, an agreement? Well, when I look at the Russian losses, uh, we know that they fired about a thousand ballistic missiles. This is thirty to forty percent of their stock. We know they've lost over a thousand combat vehicles. Um, we know they've lost around 50 airplanes. We know that they've had about up to say 12,000 troops either killed, wounded, or prisoners of war. I mean, they've never experienced this before. We know four major generals have been killed, Russian major generals. Um, of course, the Ukrainians have taken losses, but this whole campaign on the Russian side has been a total disaster right from the start. I mean, who invades a country uh, from six different directions um, and divides their forces in such a way that gives the, um, um, the, the initiative then to the defenders? And, and so um, this is a campaign that we all know that the Russians thought would be over in a couple of days, and it, and it hasn't gone that way. So, so um, for them, it's a huge loss. And so they're looking for a way out of this, uh, a safe-facing way. And of course, we're seeing uh, President uh, Zelensky uh, you know, suggest that there are ways out of this sort of thing. Perhaps Ukraine will uh, say that they will never join NATO. 
Um, perhaps the Donbass will be a recognized uh, state in the future. Um, the Crimea, it, it's, it's done with, it's Russian, and we won't talk about it anymore. Um, I would imagine these are the things on the table, but every single day that this conflict continues, the initiative passes to the Ukrainians, um, especially, especially, you know, every time we see an image on the television of, a, of a, an apartment block in, in Kiev being uh, blown up or, or elsewhere, the, the initiative is completely gone from the Russians. They have so little to call on, so much so that uh, we, we hear in the news that they're looking to have uh, Syrian mercenaries uh, come and help them. Now we know that Russia has hit rock bottom when a country of 140 million with a supposedly modern armed forces has to call on Syrian mercenaries to come and assist them in a fight like this, this is where we know uh, things are really at. Uh, Chris, I can, I can shift, shift the paradigm here a little bit and focus on, on, on the sort of cultural consequence of, of this, the more personal consequence of this war to Canadians, to, to average folks in Europe, that being, of course, the, the refugee, the emergent refugee crisis mm -hmm. and, and how that is beginning to it, that's really how that hits non-military people is how do we manage this? How do we handle this? How do we pay for this? Um, I, and I mean that in a very general sense, Chris. Um, so uh, your, your opinion on all of the how is this going to unfold? Like there are folks thinking, OK, the three, four million Ukrainians leave. Are they all going to go back at once or? Uh, you know, if a peace deal is struck, please give us your reflections on this. Yeah, there's so many ways to tackle this. Yeah. Uh, the question, John, that you've asked, it's a great question. Of course, we're seeing um, Europe uh, galvanize around the refugee issue. Uh, everybody coming to help as best they can. And we're seeing, you know, Polish soldiers and carrying uh, young children and, and so forth. It's completely overwhelming for countries like Poland. I think I, I, you know, I read this morning that the population has sort of increased overnight by 5%. Um, you know, but, you know, Turkey had the same issue with the Syrian refugees. They still have 4 million refugees, but I think the situation will be different. I think once this is resolved, people will, will go back and they'll have to because somebody's going to have to start rebuilding building and who's going to pay for that? That's another, another big question on the table. <laughs> um, now, speaking from, a, from my military hat on, um, uh, having, having the people move to a safe location is a good thing. Uh, it means that, um, you know, I'm going to be blunt here. It means I don't have to worry about them. I don't have to feed and clothe them and house them. It means that I can uh, uh, focus on the military campaign and uh, you know, getting my troops up into the front lines and, and fighting the Russians. So from a purely military perspective, if I can get the civilians away to safety, that's the best thing possible. Of course, their lives are thrown up in the air and they may not have homes to come back to. And I do understand that, but um, uh, this is key. And I think from a Canadian perspective, you know, we have such a massive diaspora here, Ukrainian diaspora, I'm seeing groups propping, popping up all over the country to help. It's just a massive effort. Um, you know, can we can we do more? Again, if I was in charge, I would be shipping every every spare weapon we have, and the not so spare, I would just send them as. And then the the planes coming back, those big C sevens that we have, I would have them full of uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees, um, mm -hmm. either bringing them here where they have families or uh, bringing folks here that need help medically. We're seeing some of that now, which is good, uh, but but getting them into, um, you know, some of our military bases. We have uh, not a lot of spare capacity, but, but, you know, just house people for now, get them yeah. to safety, let the Ukrainian forces do their job. And now if a peace agreement was signed tomorrow, um, which would be surprising if it was, um, yeah, people would want to be close by. They'd want to go home. They want to see if they have a home left. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Um, and of course, what happens in the aftermath of all this, um, the European Union uh, has to rally and more money has to be spent to rebuild uh, Ukraine. We're already um, getting cost estimates that are in the billions and billions and billions of dollars. You know, the, in terms of bringing people here, you know, it, it's a flight, right? It's an eight hour flight. It's that's all it is. And when you're in a war zone, you're only, if you've got kids and, and whatnot, you're only concerned about their safety. So you don't actually care where you are in the world as long as you're, as long as they're safe. And then, and then you, then you go home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, it's, it's just, um, 
you know, I know politically, there's always sort of calculations that are made about what we should and shouldn't do. And God knows we've spent huge sums ourselves just getting through COVID. So you, you wonder how much money is actually in the, uh, in the bank. But you know what? Who cares? Um, to me, this is, this is priority. Like now, now our latest priority um, to just bring people back. Do it. Yeah, Robin, we're so fortunate to have people with Chris Kilford's wide military and diplomatic experience nearby. He's just sort of lower Vancouver Island here. For him to give us a, an expert viewpoint on the terrible tragedy in Ukraine. And I suppose, unfortunately, we'll certainly have to have him back again soon. I, I'm, I'm sure we will. And we're gonna have other experts as well. Uh, the Canadian uh, International Council, which he's uh, the branch president, in Victoria, it's the largest branch actually in Canada, but there's so many highly qualified people in military and diplomatic fields that are, are on Vancouver Island. They live here, they've, they've retired here, but they're hardly retired. They're very active and boy, there's a lot of smart people that we can rely on, but we'll definitely have Chris Kilford back. Yeah. And you know, another guest we've had regularly on this show on civic issues is counselor Stephen Andrew. And uh, Stephen Andrews got himself in the middle of a, a bit of a controversy right now because uh, there's been a, a, a big drive on city council in Victoria to help empower the First Nations, the song he's in the Esquimalt, in the name of reconciliation, they want to put a letter to taxpayers saying, on top of paying your taxes, could you pay more to the song he's and Esquimalt nations, and you might pay five, 10 percent equal to what you'd be paying in your in your city taxes to the First Nations. And Stephen Andrews taken the approach that, to, you know, really, this isn't the role of civic governments to be doing this. If people want to make contributions to the Songhees and the Esquimalt, they should. And, uh, well, we thought we'd better circle back and see what he thought about this whole idea of uh, civic government stepping in and directly asking for extra funding. It's outside the jurisdiction of the municipal government, so therefore uh, I see it as pure virtue signaling. I support reconciliation. If people want to donate to the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations, they can do that anytime they want. Uh, I support reconciliation. What I would say is if those councillors that are bringing this forward want to get into provincial and federal jurisdictions, then certainly they should run on those levels. Robin, I've worked with the First Nations uh, uh, um, communities in Lower Vancouver Island now for about three years. I have very personal interpretations of reconciliation and what it means to me. And uh, I frankly don't need to be told. Very much appreciate Stephen Andrews' clip on this issue over the recently, over this past week, and it drew a lot of response, a lot of response. Several people were upset and here's a couple of those comments. Dismissing the work of reconciliation as someone else's problem is precisely the colonial siloing of social issues that permits a generation of poverty to persist. And this one, Mr. Andrews' way of thinking asserts a hierarchical view of society, which is deeply rooted in white supremacy, the very essence of colonialism. Some strong feelings out there, John. And I, you know, I got another note from an old mission classmate of mine, and she is of, she has some Aboriginal heritage, and uh, she writes, "I think our government should be doing that, as in supporting First Nations, as we pay into the tax system. If a taxpayer is so inclined, then great. But I think city council should make reconciliations." in other ways on behalf of taxpayers. And you know, I, I would add to that, I had another fellow uh, contact me earlier today, and he said, you know, perhaps people could be simply encouraged to make contributions to charities that are operated by the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations and other First Nations up and down Vancouver Island and across the province. Many First Nations have charitable organizations. They would appreciate financial contributions, and you get a tax write-off as well. But the main thing is, you know, the money's going directly to those First Nations for purposes that they have in mind and money that they can use. So I think maybe that is a solution overall to this problem. And I, I think it's uh, 
It's, it's, it's a great a tricky, idea. It's a tricky road, John. Yeah. But uh, we'll we'll talk more about that, and we'll talk more about uh, some of our other favorite topics about being accused of being colonialists and and woke labeling. But uh, it's time to wrap things up and uh, talk a little bit before we go about how people can like us, subscribe to us, support Victoria Rumble Room, and be part of our Rumble family. Robin, as our viewership grows, uh, certainly we've recognized uh, the desire to thank our viewers, whether you agree with us or not. We really appreciate watching across all of these platforms that we've created to get our message out. And each of them hits a different market. And so now there's our Facebook link and, and of course our Twitter link and our YouTube link, which houses all of, all of our interviews. And then we have a website that links into our, our podcast functionality, believe it or not. Some people don't wanna watch us all the time. And then of course there is Instagram and TikTok and those become our six ways. Oh, yes. Oh, and our new, our new, our new thing. Our yes. new thing. Our new Facebook group, which we are forming to allow even more viewer inputs. Rumble Room, Rumble Room News and Information. Excellent. And that's going to become, we think, quite a vibrant place in which on top of all these other platforms, you can provide your opinion. So now, I think we need to end the show. Uh, we're getting down to our limit of where people go, hey, I'm out of here, got to go for lunch. And as always, I remain Yanni. Some people call me Yanni. Yanni Yurichic, the Croatian sensation. I'm Rockin' Robin Adair at Rumble On.